Hey, good morning, everyone. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes um, as the attendees, as the people start to filter in. And once uh, the level of attendees evens out, uh, we'll start the worker. All right, it looks like the number of attendees has slowed down or being added. Um, so I guess we'll get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sam Greger. I'm a manager with the California Air Resources Board. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to our um, second work group to discuss uh, the clean mobility investment projects for the fiscal year 2022-2023 clean transportation incentives. Um, this is one of a number of work groups um, that we hold uh, as part of our public process for uh, developing the funding plan each year. And it includes uh, light duty, uh, ZEV market investments, um, mobility investments, uh, uh, which are under our equity portfolio, and then our heavy duty investments um, to move our state forward to get zero emission vehicles out there and um, folks into um, clean mobility options. Um, as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. Um, we anticipate the recording to be available on the Low Carbon Transportation Investments meetings and workshops page in about two to four weeks. Uh, the agenda and slides for the work group are also on that web page, and they've been posted in the chat for, for ease of, of getting, to that, getting to those. Um, we'll be leveraging Zoom webinar the raised hand and the Q&A box features to help facilitate comments and questions. Uh, the directions are provided in the presentation for each comment period as a reminder. If there are any disruptions, including malicious intent, uh, we'll immediately end the meeting and send out a notice for rescheduling. So fingers crossed, um, we've had good meetings to date. Um, we also can't allow anonymous participants for security reasons. So please make sure your name is clear on the Zoom platform. Um, again, thank you all for taking the time to uh, meet and, uh, meeting with us today in a virtual world. Hopefully soon we'll be able to meet in person. Um, but we look forward to the work group discussion, getting into weeds and some, some of the things we're presenting today. And uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Ashley Giorgio, who's one of the lead staff for the mobility portion of the long-term plan. She'll walk you through the agenda and the work group discussion. And then later we'll hear from Bree Swinson who will introduce the long-term plan proposal and, the, and questions to help guide uh, the discussion moving forward. So uh, again, thank you and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Sam. And thank you everyone. Good morning. Uh, we have allotted uh, three hours for discussion today from nine to noon. We'll see how that goes. We might have some extra time. Uh, there are deliberate pauses for comments and questions between topics. Uh, we wanna hear your ideas, it's really critical, as well as feedback for how CARB should move forward with our clean mobility investments. We've included some guiding questions towards the end of the slides, which we really hope will help us think through our proposal and what we might need to change or is missing. So if there are specific ideas of interest or questions or concerns, please feel free to raise your hand in Zoom, or of course you can always enter in the Q&A box as well. If for any reason your questions or comments go beyond what we can adequately address today, 
in the designated comment periods that we have, cover topics that might be outside of our focus for the long-term plan or cannot be addressed in full due to any timing constraints, which I hope won't be a problem today. Uh, we'll be sure to follow up accordingly after the work group meeting or direct you to the appropriate resources. We are also still open to having direct discussions with folks who might be interested anytime. So our first topic today will be a recap of the February 17th work group and additional feedback that we have received as it relates to our mobility projects. We will then build on the February 17th work group discussion on evaluations of our projects and discuss scope, areas of focus, our progress, and of course, timelines. Lastly, we will discuss the long-term plan proposal and also post questions for open discussion, as I just mentioned. We'll be sure to conclude today's meeting with upcoming events and meetings you should be aware of and next steps. Today marks the second of three work groups to support development of the long-term plan for clean mobility investments. Each work group is meant to build on the other. So we will cover some reminder content today and outcomes from the February 17th work group. And we'll also do the same for the last meeting we have planned in late May. Senate Bill 1275 is the legislative driver behind long-term plan development. There are two critical complementary pieces of the plan, including vehicle purchase incentives and the zero emission vehicle market and clean mobility equity projects. The mobility equity projects portion we are discussing today includes outreach related activities we discussed in the last work group, such as technical assistance, capacity building, and workforce training and development. We have been doing long-term plans since fiscal year 2016-17. This is a critical part of our process for longer range planning to allow for funds to be leveraged in the best possible way. Today's work group provides specific questions that we would like everyone to be thinking about for how we move ahead with these long-term investments. The purpose is to walk you through the long-term plan proposal and seek additional input for consideration as the plan is solidified. The core pieces of CARB's approach to developing a long-term plan for clean mobility investments is taking a deeper dive into the feedback we've received to date from project administration, as well as implementation since projects began in fiscal year 2014-15. This, along with ongoing feedback, especially from those using mobility services, and of course, all of you today, will help CARB determine the best way forward and will allow for the desired transition from smaller scale pilots to community-based and centered equity programs. So what does this mean? A transition requires analysis of investment gaps as mobility programs are being implemented over time, including progress on Senate Bill 350, low-income barriers report recommendations, and accelerating investments in such a way that expands service offerings and, of course, allows more equitable outcomes, such as diversified investment in impacted communities statewide. <clears throat> The governor's January 2022 proposed budget um, for fiscal year 2022-23 is 419 million across multiple years, signaling the importance of building a thoughtful plan for how and where funding should be spent. This is the basis for our long-term plan proposal currently, but there may have to be changes based on what happens in the final May 2022 budget. The long-term plan proposal provides more information on how we are currently thinking these funds could be split across our mobility projects, pending further direction in the final budget. More discussion will take place upon seeing the May budget. It's important to keep in mind that our mobility project funding could also be influenced by the governor's recent $10 billion zero emission vehicle acceleration package. 
This acceleration package was developed in response to increased gas prices and broader impacts in communities. The core goal is to accelerate the transition to zero emission vehicles by providing an influx of funding for programs in the near term. As a result, funding for mobility projects could be accelerated to communities. We do not know how this could happen or by how much. For now, we're working based on an assumption of 419 million across multiple years as outlined in the January budget. But we're also preparing ourselves for potential changes that might come. There's a continued desire to promote and support sustainable communities and reduce vehicle miles traveled as we implement our clean transportation projects. This is a clear message that's been carried forward in the January budget, the acceleration proposal, and also Assembly Bill 285, the California Transportation Assessment Report which was released by the California Strategic Growth Council back in February. This provides a reminder of our clean mobility investments currently underway as discussed in the February 17th work group. We have our regional based pilot projects in Los Angeles, Sacramento, the Bay Area, San Joaquin Valley, and Santa Cruz County which garnered key lessons applied to creating the Clean Mobility Options Voucher Pilot Program, or CMO, Clean Mobility in Schools, and the Sustainable Transportation Equity Project, or STEP. CMO addresses Senate Bill 350 Low Income Barriers Report recommendations and community input, as well as the need for streamlined statewide access to mobility funding with the goal of improving under-resourced communities' access to clean mobility options that are safe, reliable, convenient, and affordable. Clean mobility in schools addresses unique clean mobility needs of the schools and maximizes emission benefits across sectors, such as school buses, infrastructure, lawn and garden equipment, and educational curriculum to boldly transform school communities, increase awareness, and accessibility to clean technology, promote mode shifting, and maximize emission reductions. STEP addresses community identified transportation needs via a more, flex more flexibility, larger projects, and community involvement with the goal of increasing transportation equity in under-resourced communities. We foresee the clean mobility funding will be focused on CMO, clean mobility in schools, step, and planning and capacity building as the primary drivers and foundation for community investments. This is reflected in the long-term plan proposal. CARB is focused in working to improve our investments as they evolve, and these existing programs provide a good basis and starting point for that to happen. One critical element of our work is providing information on CARB's clean mobility investments in a transparent manner for the public. This includes documentation on lessons learned across our programs. Here we've included critical links and resources we wanted to make sure everyone has handy as we discuss our long-term plans for clean mobility projects. We encourage using these resources to keep track of the latest project information and highlights, but of course you can always reach out to staff directly as well. So now we will transition to a discussion of past feedback received on the mobility portion of the long-term plan development, both in the February 17th work group and other discussions as well. First, I wanted to provide some grounding for the discussion. We've included transportation equity, the definition here, as a reminder of what has been discussed in previous work groups. This is the focus of our clean mobility investments and something we may need to revisit as we move ahead to make sure that we are meeting our equity goals. We realize this definition was something vetted through the STEP solicitation public process a few years ago. 
So we welcome new ideas for additional items we should be including to reflect our goals, as well as the current needs and priorities in communities. One idea is additional emphasis on workforce training and development, and a transition to zero emission jobs based on the feedback that we've heard to date. The next two slides build upon content presented at the February 17th work group. We wanted to actively reflect the concerns raised for how we make projects financially sustainable beyond the CARB funding provided, and also prioritizing workforce training and development as a key equity principle across our mobility investments. We also wanted to reflect comments specific to prioritizing investments in African American and other communities of color. We want to make sure our outreach strategies and methods of investment consider the needs of those most impacted and underrepresented. We hope that there will be more information to share on the demographics of our investments in the late May work group meeting, and of course, in our funding plan process moving forward. One of the key recommendations we have heard is to streamline the mobility grant application process and simplify based on the size and scope of projects. This will be a critical consideration. One potential avenue to assist with this is looking for ways to better align existing programs as we go out with new solicitations. Documenting and sharing key lessons will continue to be part of CARB's process. In addition to refining our websites and how information is presented, one example would be, uh, or how this is happening, would be through the development of the Clean Mobility Equity Alliance, where current mobility project grantees, mobility practitioners, and others come together to share their experiences in implementing programs. Prioritizing investments in underserved communities is key but we have to balance investments geographically and find ways, even when we're moving ahead with existing projects, to ensure new communities can access this funding. Even with a multi-year proposal and more funding than in previous years, we will have to prioritize these investments as stated. Part of this will be direct outreach and engagement in African American communities and communities of color, and other impacted areas, such as tribal and rural communities. Next, let's discuss specific feedback mechanisms CARB is leveraging for long-term plan development and to make refinements to mobility investments over time. We hold public work group meetings and facilitate direct discussions with interested stakeholders. This is one way of receiving input such as we are for today's discussion, but there are other ways that are equally important. CARB receives quarterly status reports and final reports from clean mobility project grantees, sub-grantees, as well as other supporting partners. These provide key lessons, challenges, and critical project data that can be analyzed to understand the results of our investments. Surveys have been one element of collecting information for mobility projects. We gather information from users, for example, from car sharing to understand their experiences and how services could better meet their needs. Past solicitations, including information received from successful and unsuccessful applicants, are absolutely critical in evaluating our mobility programs. This is one area we hope to address um, feedback on clarifying objectives to reflect the need for streamlined application process, as I mentioned earlier, and to consider the size and scope and develop requirements that best fit those constraints. Project administrators, including the CMO statewide administrator, have also provided feedback to CARB on the importance of these programs and the need for flexibility as communities evolve over time. Step efforts to evaluate technical assistance and outcomes and specific solicitation elements has provided CARB with concrete recommendations for how to improve 
solicitations in the future. And draw from applicant and grantee feedback, as well as their own experiences with past programs. Lastly, I just wanted to mention how important it is to work closely with our state partners as we evaluate mobility investments. Consistent with the AB 285 Clean Transportation Assessment Report that I mentioned earlier, we want to be proactive in finding ways to better align our programs. For example, we want to complement the active transportation program that Caltrans administers and not be overly duplicative with these investments or cause confusion. We've also been partnering closely with the California Energy Commission, given the close ties to clean transportation program investments and goals. Um, and in this way, we've been working with them on the clean mobility options voucher pilot and workforce training and development investments. The California Strategic Growth Council is another critical partner, not just based on the AB 285 report findings, but for development of regional climate collaboratives, the transfer, uh, transformative climate communities program that they're implementing, and also technical assistance, capacity building, and other planning efforts where we can better align and complement our investments. This is one key element of making sure our investments are more equitable and meeting broader climate change goals. It is challenging to capture all the great feedback that we've heard over the years regarding our mobility projects. We appreciate all the engagement and willingness to share ideas and solutions. We want to make sure these projects meet intended goals and bring benefits to those most impacted by air pollution. Here, we've done our best to elevate common themes and needs, though this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. There's much more that we as a state agency need to better understand within communities. Continuous updates to these programs will be extremely helpful to ensure that communities are actually benefiting from these investments. I'm going to leave this slide up for just a moment so that people can take a look at this and try to decide for themselves what additional things rise to the top. And if there are other essential items that CARB should be considering in how we structure our mobility investments. In spite of the challenges we have faced and work to overcome, each project is equally important and serves a critical purpose and role in defining the clean mobility landscape of the state. We just need to make sure that the benefits are as intended, that we can avoid unintentional harms, and also those most impacted can reap the benefits directly from these investments. Next, we will discuss how and where we are evaluating investment progress and benefits in communities. This was a, top a topic that we covered briefly in the February 17th work group, and one that we plan to pick back up again in our last mobility long-term plan work group meeting in May, given its importance in building out our strategy for investments. So CARB's methods of evaluating mobility investments are multidimensional, as we realize that not one avenue will be enough to fully and comprehensively analyze mobility projects. This includes internal, third party, and project grantee and administrator evaluation. The primary goal of our evaluation methodology is to update and use existing and data collected to measure and report out on each critical metric. CARB must also report to the legislature and CARB board on these metrics over time. More discussion will take place in the May work group meeting specific to metrics for our clean mobility investments. CARB is also leveraging other mechanisms to assess clean mobility investment program effectiveness. This is an essential element of all California climate investments, and especially those focused on equity and communities. 
Here we've provided some examples of project elements we consider when evaluating and building understanding of where the gaps are or where needs are not addressed or identified. This includes vehicle telematics and zero emission usage data, user surveys where personal experiences are shared, focus group discussions with community members, opinion data collection even beyond just vehicles to include zero emission equipment as well, <clears throat> as well as one-on-one -on -one interviews with mobility users and practitioners. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> as well as local entities. Emphasis is on evaluation elements that further CARB's ability to understand, measure, <coughs> excuse me, can maximize socioeconomic benefits and demographic data and impacts, and support an evolution from smaller scale projects to more comprehensive and streamlined community based programs, as I discussed with you all earlier. <laughs> Excuse me. Lovely allergy season. <laughs> Evaluation of program outcomes and community benefits is an essential element of our mobility investments. As such, CARB is working to evaluate greenhouse gas and vehicle miles traveled reductions now in our programs. This is pursuant to SB 535, as well as our Assembly Bill 1550 requirements and part of meeting our equity goals through complementary policies as well. CARB projects require clean and measurable metrics to assess socioeconomic benefits as well as behavioral changes as a result of these community investments. We want to measure if there has been increased access to key destinations, goods, and services, and assess what the baseline is but also where conditions have changed as a result of investments to measure progress, such as increased home ownership, use of personal vehicles, as well as health disparities. We also seek improved visibility and acceptance of zero emission mobility options. Increasingly important and aligned with the governor's goals and acceleration package is increasing travel cost savings as we build out our programs. CARB understands that due to the complex nature of our mobility investments, there has to be a careful analysis, both qualitative and quantitative data will also be required. Ongoing review of project effectiveness and outcomes is essential. These projects are not stagnant, and thus we have to gather data at multiple points in the project cycle. This also sets us up for being able to consider lessons as we go along, so that we can work to avoid needing to make big changes to our programs all at once. Solicitation and application evaluations allow us to streamline and improve our competitive grant process, and also address feedback we heard on the need to streamline mobility funding. We also are getting ongoing grantee and partner feedback, including from our Clean Mobility Options voucher recipients. As mentioned, there is a desire to ensure we'll build, we're building out community capacity and exposure and awareness of mobility options available. And we'll consider critical outreach metrics as we move ahead with those investments. Some benefits are hard to quantify such as those that are more subjective and focused on quality of life improvements and building local wealth. We wanna to continue to learn from communities directly as to what metrics we should be using to assess these benefits from the mobility investments we're making. Behavioral changes are also critical, um, but they're challenging to measure given the desire to isolate changes resulting specifically from these investments. So that they're a critical consideration in meeting our equity goals nonetheless. This is something that CARB wants to measure over time to assess our magnitude of impact. As mentioned in the last work group meeting and briefly earlier on in the slides, demographic data collection specific to our projects, who they serve, 
the organizational structure and leadership will be important. This information has been collected from our grantees. So CARD plans to compile and include that information not only in the May work group meeting, but as part of our yearly analysis and funding plan process. As mentioned, CARB is actively seeking opportunities to complement efforts being done in development of this year's Senate Bill 150 <clears throat> report to the legislature and development of sustainable community strategies. Given the importance in building a more balanced and community serving transportation system. Feedback has been gathered as part of the Senate Bill 150 report process that we will take into account here as we move ahead with our long term planning and our mobility investments overall. For example, the Metropolitan Transportation or apologies, Metropolitan Planning Organizations or MPOs and local entities have shared their ideas such as the need for less planning and more support to allow for implementation of projects in their communities. CARB's mobility investments have an increasing role in helping to support the regional targets statewide for greenhouse gas and vehicle miles traveled reductions. CARB has multiple third-party evaluation contracts in place that are intended to support review of program outcomes, as well as financing mechanisms, MPO project selection, et cetera. Some of these were mentioned in the February 17th work group, but we wanted to be sure to follow up to, to share the scope of each project, the methodology that's being used to evaluate our programs, current status, and the general timeline for when results will be shared. This includes contracts with the University of California, Berkeley, Othering and Belonging Institute, and the Transportation and Sustainability Research Center at Berkeley, Steer Group, and the University of California, Los Angeles Institute of Transportation Studies. We understand more third-party evaluation will be needed. Um, and it will have to take place as we increase funding for multi-year investments. But this does provide a good start and key insights for how we move ahead. We want to acknowledge the feedback we heard in the last work group meeting and the need to include partners beyond the UC system to allow for differing perspectives and to further elevate equity goals. All of these contracts are in the early stages of their development, so we wanted to make sure to highlight that. We will expect further information will be shared down the line as we get updates on our mobility projects, including key findings and program considerations and recommendations. So the UC Berkeley Othering and Belonging Institute, or OBI, um, that contract kicked off in late 2021. CARB commissioned OBI to build the capacity of the state and communities across California to advance equitable community-based transportation planning. The project includes a discovery phase um, and, and an evaluation study, as well as technical assistance to step planning and capacity building grantees and continuous improvement elements as well. Today, I'm going to provide just a brief overview of the discovery and evaluation work that is underway and also what's planned. So this includes analysis of reports and data from the STEP and CMO pilot projects, conducting key informant interviews on STEP and CMO pilot programs, but also community transportation needs assessments to understand viewpoints of people with diverse backgrounds and opinions and support the development of areas of focus for upcoming evaluation and continuous improvement of our work. Also seeking feedback from community rooted organizations and individuals on methods proposed to create knowledge within these impacted communities, intended program beneficiaries, key personnel, and other state agency partners. It's also important to note here that research will be paused at the end of May to circle back with the community partners and key personnel to invite participants to check the work of the research team and provide guidance and informed consent regarding the knowledge they've shared and how it will be used in the process. 
OBI and UC Davis researchers are working with CARB to evaluate CMO and step approaches to community transportation needs assessments and more equitable state transportation projects, seeking to better understand and address barriers to delivering direct and meaningful benefits to equity seeking communities statewide. Providing opportunities for both early and regular consultation prior to key decision points with intended program beneficiaries is an important accountability mechanism. And for the study, it's part, partly to ensure the team is creating knowledge with individuals and organizations who represent strong public constituencies with different expertise than the university and government agencies. Trust and relationship building with people from historically marginalized communities are crucial to this process and the contract here. Building and maintaining respectful partnerships is critical as well. And over time, may develop into trust, which is a key component of this research. As programs are evaluated and improved to meet community needs, stipends and additional funding support are anticip anticipated to be utilized here to ensure that people who are impacted by the evaluation have the opportunity to play an integral role in design, coordination and execution of the evaluation activities and that their knowledge is incorporated into the evaluation findings. The team anticipates the public facing engagement process will begin in September of this year and will be extended through approximately May 2023. To support the completion of a detailed equity recommendations report in June of 2023 and final evaluation in October 2023. If you are interested in creating knowledge with the OBI team or receiving project updates, definitely let us know your preferred contact methods and we'll ensure OBI adds you to the project partner list. The UC Berkeley Transportation and Sustainability Research Center contract kicked off in June, 2020. This contract is evaluating car funded mobility projects to determine progress and improving mobility reducing greenhouse gas emissions, vehicle miles traveled, et cetera. This focuses on CARB's legacy regional projects that I mentioned to you earlier in the presentation, as well as a subset of CMO and NARSTAT projects. Currently, we are in the planning phase. The evaluation planning and data gathering requirements phase of the project is nearly complete and user, user survey instruments are being developed with our grantees. A summary of key findings and lessons will be provided in 2023 and final reporting in 2024. One new effort that CARB just kicked off in the last few months is with Steer Group to review and analyze financing tools that are out there as well as strategies available for building sustainable community level mobility options in California's impacted communities. STEER is working to identify tools used in other programs and projects to finance mobility services that have not followed the pathway of direct grants and to understand tools and other methods used to sustain financing for projects beyond the transportation sector. This contract is critical in addressing the financial sustainability challenges CARB has been hearing from our grantees, as well as our program administrators and other stakeholders. CARB hopes that this effort will shed light on mobility funding solutions, as well as um, show solutions that best adapt to the unique needs of our communities. The University of California Los Angeles Institute of Transportation Studies contract kicked off in March of this year. The research team's first task is to review regional transportation plans and sustainable community strategies as well, to look at the project selection tools and practices for a select group of MPOs. This includes, just for a couple of examples, the Bay Area Metropolitan Transportation Commission, Southern California Association of Gov Governments, as well as the Fresno Council of Governments and San Joaquin Valley Council of Governments. 
This contract will be critical to support CARB's internal evaluation of how mobility projects can support more sustainable communities and how SCS implementation might fit into CARB programs. The focus of this work is to determine alignment of sustainable community strategies with our climate goals. There are no findings to share yet from this effort, but we will keep you all posted as to progress on this contract. We will post updates and deliverables on our website and provide critical information in our yearly updates on mobility investments. In addition to internal review and analysis of project benefits and outcomes, and working with third-party contractors to evaluate our projects, CARB is exploring what other potential mechanisms there might be to assess broader mobility program effectiveness and to do so on an ongoing basis. So some ideas that we have here on this slide include an equity advisory committee, which would have more direct program level involvement and review equity more holistically across programs as one option. We're also open to thoughts on whether or not this would make sense and be in line with what the stakeholders are really looking for to do a deeper review of our programs, as well as ongoing ability to provide input and see how this results in policy changes. While third-party evaluation is not a new mechanism because we just discussed that earlier in the slides, it's one we wanna to continue to build out. Our goal is to determine additional needs to measure benefits based on findings from existing third-party efforts. Third-party contracts provide some checks and balances and also avoid relying on data and information from only a few parties. This includes research from, for example, um, community-centered mobility programs and other mechanisms. And as mentioned, this could go beyond traditional research partners to deepen our understanding of where CARB is in meeting our transportation, as well as our equity goals. In addition to the contracts, CARB evaluates mobility projects across our project phases, which will be increasingly important in long-term planning to ensure feedback is robust, but also considers needs and challenges at each step of the process. For example, should we make programmatic changes? We ask these questions as we develop the funding plan for clean transportation incentives. As projects are implemented, we hold work groups that dive into the weeds on program elements, but also address community level considerations through direct conversations and engagement. We also have our Community Clean Mobility Equity Alliance through the CMO Voucher Pilot Program that I mentioned briefly, which will inform implementation, design, and investment improvements based on shared lessons across our grantees and mobility practitioners. We want to better assess community outcomes and review the right things and consider what methods make sense. Is it cost benefit analysis? Um, we want to make sure we review specific socioeconomic and demographic characteristics as well. We want to be conscious of where analysis happens and what actions we take as a result. So we're considering the Senate Bill 350 Low Income Barriers Report actions as well and assessing how we're increasing access to mobility options based on the community needs identified. So really the central theme for evaluation are program equity and community driven outcomes, socioeconomic benefits, program effectiveness, as well as those critical demographic characteristics to assess who has or who has not reached or been reached through our mobility investments. So I know that was a lot of content. Um, so I wanna pause here to see if folks have any specific questions on anything that we discussed. Um, we will kind of give it a few seconds for folks to either raise their hand or submit a question or comment in the QA box. Thank you. Okay, um, we've had a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, go there real quick. 
um, from Najari Smith. Uh, why were local organizations not prioritized? And this was an amazing opportunity to support local groups on the ground working to increase clean mobility. So I, I definitely don't think the intent was to not prioritize local groups. So I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about which portion of the presentation you're referring to, maybe in the objectives section, but just wanna emphasize that we're looking at both the state and local levels. And that's gonna be really essential, especially as we're su supporting the sustainable communities piece of our mobility investments. Um, Sam, yeah, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, it's a great question, um, and I think it was around slide 14, 15 when, when we started, uh, when you started the discussion on feedback mechanisms, but please put in there additional information if it's, if it's not. Um, we've always depended upon the local organizations that our projects are trying to support to give us feedback um, ever since we began these projects in Sacramento and LA. Um, I'll just provide a couple of examples of where their feedback has been critical. Um, for Blue LA, we, we provided funding through the city um, to local organizations to help develop that project, um, how to outreach to communities, where to, launch, where to put infrastructure and provide cars. Um, so they were critical in the development of that program. Um, since, since these projects have launched, um, either we or our, our, our program administrator, CalSTART and SEMC, have met with a lot of the local organizations that have either, either been funded directly or have uh, been able to utilize these services and have received a lot of great feedback. And over the years, we've gone from really funding just cars and infrastructure to funding all of the different things that, that um, has been mentioned in this presentation. And now we're at the point where we're at a, at a uh, where we can really evaluate what we're doing and figure out how we can grow these pilots to community-based programs and being a lot more, um, providing a lot more flexibility and, and being able to make those adjustments. Um, another example is with the voucher program, we had the needs assessments um, grantees uh, report back to us. And there's a, actually a video of a, a presentation, a number of presentations in which um, they went through what was working and what didn't work, how the funding um, that was provided helped them understand better what their mobility needs are in their, in their communities. Um, I see that your hand is raised. So if you want, uh, Sean, if you can open up the mic and we can continue to continue this dialogue. Or not. Um, you also had a couple of other questions. Um, one is how is the equity advisory group developed on that slide 26? Um, this is a question for, for you guys to help us um, understand if an if equity advisory group for mobility and, and um, our outreach and capacity building is something that would be useful. Um, we do have a number of organizations that are focused on equity, like the Green Lining Institute, which really help us by providing a lot of feedback on what we're doing. But we don't have an actual advisory group specific to this, uh, this funding pot. So, you know, the first question is, should we develop one? And then um, how would we, you know, develop it? Who should be a part of that equity group? Those are some of the, some of the uh, questions we have as far as um, getting feedback from you guys to, to determine, you know, what path we should move forward, whether we do try to launch an equity advisory group or not. Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, dealing with uh, some technical difficulties, one sec here. Um, while you're doing that, I guess that's to try to get Najari, um, the mic opened up. Um, Piet Kanin asked, can you tell us more about the governor's ZEV acceleration package funded at $10 billion? How much more money does this funding source provide and what is the process to increase ZEV funding if that is the case? So um, the ZEV acceleration package um, 
what that would do um, is if um, that's passed by the legislature and signed into the budget, what it would potentially do would um, take funding that is, is currently existing in the surplus and that add that into last year's fiscal year's budget. Um, that would be to accelerate the, the ZEB purchasing incentives um, that could also accelerate some of the funding that we have uh, that the governor proposed in January. Um, at this point, we don't know if or when or if or how much that money um, could be accelerated for these mobility projects. Uh, his May revise uh, should be coming out, I believe, between May 10th and May 15th. So we'll have a much more additional information in our next work group in, at the end of May. So Sam, it look, we do. Looks we like do we're have... having trouble with raised hands. Ashley, I don't know if that's something that you can manage. Yeah, I can. I can do that on my end, definitely, because we have Stephanie um, who has her raised hand. So let me allow Stephanie to speak now. Okay. Hello. This is Stephanie Charkovitz with the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. I'm the lead staff implementing the Our Community Car Share Sacramento program. I wanted to echo the previous comments about the project's need for additional time and money. Getting mobility projects off the ground is a heavy lift. Sustainability in priority populations is difficult if we want to keep these projects affordable. Without continued financial support, many of these projects could lead to stranded assets. Um, I also wanted to say I'm very excited to see um, and to hear about the STEER group and to uh, see and hear about uh, the findings in their evaluation. I know they're just getting started. Um, I think that information is going to be extremely valuable for all of these projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Really appreciate the feedback and your ongoing support and all the great work you're doing. Thank you. Okay, we have another question or comment in the Q&A um, from Creighton Randall. Uh, would be very much in support of an equity advisory process that prioritizes community-rooted organizations. Current process, Clean Mobility Equity Alliance has been invite only and limited to a pool of existing grantees, which are often local regional government entities and is missing voices from priority populations. And Sam looks like you'll take, want to take this one. Yeah, thanks for the comment, Creighton. And, and, um, to be clear, the Clean Mobility Equity Alliance was created as part of the statewide voucher program, and it's to help the organizations that are currently getting grant funding. There is uh, the opportunity that we're, we're trying to um, bring in other folks, other communities that didn't receive funding but are able to, um, to, to uh, get those resources um, as uh, additional funding becomes available. So. Um, the process to get to that point was definitely slowed up the last couple of years uh, because of COVID, but um, one of the goals is to have that alliance be open to the public and to local organizations. Um, but your comment on equity advisory process, yeah, that um, we'll be in touch, Creighton, and, and get more information from you on, um, on what you think that could entail. Or you can uh, you can speak up at this meeting and let us know your thoughts if if you've been able to, or if you have any additional thoughts. Um, but I appreciate it. Okay, we have uh, one more comment from Creighton um, and regarding additional third party assessments. Would you consider directly sharing public sharing? of information on how projects are doing beyond contracting for additional technical services evaluation for contracts is a lot. CARB may want to consider moving to set up 
public facing dashboards and or mobility data specification standards that will allow all residents to see the results of these programs. Both LA DOT, Blue LA and Mio Car are moving in this direction and it should be quick and very inexpensive. And Sam looks like you'll take this one also. Yeah, either I or another one on our panel can can take it. Um, yeah, that's a good point. We're actually um, working on um, collecting the data and being able to present it in a way that's easy to see um, online. And so, yeah, we'll work with you on on um, what you guys are thinking about doing and how we can do that for all of our programs. Sam, I'll, I'll just add a couple quick things. First of all, Creighton, thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Um, we're definitely looking at how we can make information more readily accessible across our programs, not just the user data page that we shared in the earlier slides, but something even more robust over time. So this is definitely an area where we would love to seek some feedback on how we can make that most, most useful for the folks that are most impacted, because that's obviously the, the core goal. Um, and then I also wanted to just ask a, a really quick question on your last um, comment, Creighton, in the Q&A box on prioritizing community-rooted organizations as part of the equity advisory process. I was just wondering if you'd be willing to share any organizations that might come to mind. And it can be offline as well. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that I'd like to hear some additional suggestions. Thank you, Creighton. Okay. Um there's a raised hand in the Q and A, or sorry, the uh, participants list here. And Ashley, can I ask you to unmute Linda? Linda's uh, line here. Absolutely, Linda. You should be able to speak once you've unmuted. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Hi. Good morning. Thank you, Linda Kamushian with Grid Alternatives and the Director of Shared Mobility, and I've had the opportunity to be. Uh, directly engaged with uh, these programs and appreciate the, the effort uh, your staff and, and everyone has put towards helping to reach all these, uh, these goals um, and, and making these projects successful. I just wanted to uh, uh, sort of plus one some of the comments going on already. So uh, definitely the equity advisory group uh, is a important effort. Of course, there are other areas and um, you know, ways that we can leverage existing uh, spaces to uplift some of these objectives in terms of strength, you know, determining what's important across programs. Uh, but a lot of the, the projects here, I would say both in specifically uh, STEP and CMO, we're dealing with uh, dynamic factors of, of uh, change in terms of projects. So in shared mobility, how, the, how things have shifted even from just four or five years ago uh, and how we need to be responsive in that space. So both from an equity perspective, but also from just the knowledge base that we need to uh, you know, cultivate and have um, access to in order to make these projects successful. Uh, and I think the important part there would be, um, you know, people's time is definitely uh, important to, to make sure that they are, um, uh, you know, effectively uh, leveraged, but also, um, you know, uh, compensated in some fashion too. It, it is time and money to, to be a part of these processes. So especially if we're working with uh, lower capacity organizations, uh, community rooted organizations, we wanna make sure that their time and, and um, effort is compensated in any of these efforts. Uh, the other I would say is that to Stephanie's point earlier, uh, any projects that are currently in the pipeline uh, could could be um, uh, could benefit from evaluation of, of an additional investment and making sure that you know the the conditions that have changed, for example, in vehicle purchases, uh, bicycle purchases, uh, the supply chain aspects, uh, any type of operations that are now the reality today as we're getting these projects launched and moving that were different from how things were proposed um, even several years ago. Uh, need to be addressed in terms of how we can make these these current projects successful as 
as we are looking at expanding the funds to other areas as well. So just wanted to, to add that is that because the goal here is mobility and not necessarily profit, which profit is often something um, that drives uh, additional investments in, in the private sector, um, we want to make sure that people have access to these projects and they are successful. And so that will require more time and money. Uh, so just wanted to highlight that here as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda, your critical thought partner in all of this. We appreciate the feedback and just wanted to emphasize that we agree on the dynamic nature and the need to be responsive. Um, that's part of the reason why we covered some of the upfront material in today's slides. We just wanted to be as responsive as possible to everything that we've heard to date and continue to adapt based on changes in communities. And also just want to support, you know, the continued, you know, sustainability factor for our existing projects is going to be really valuable as well. So thanks for all the great feedback. Sam, anything you wanted to add? I just, I just want to make one logistical, logistical comment. Um, our work, this work group is being recorded. And so um, when you put a comment in the question and answer, it's great. It's easy for us to read. We are going to read it out loud so that it is part of the, the video. So what, uh, just so you know, you can ask questions both ways. So um, uh, with that, I'll let you guys continue. We just had one more um, comment in the Q&A, and this is going back to a uh, comment made by Najari, uh, a request from Claire Bachman. And Claire asks, uh, if you're comfortable, would you mind sharing the names of the community-based organizations that you feel are being left out? Uh, and that, Najari, if you feel comfortable, you can add that in the chat or um, message one of us, we can add it. Or you can raise your hand and be on video. Oh, there we go. And we have a raised hand from Najari. Uh, Ashley, if you wouldn't mind unmuting that line. Uh, Najari, you are unmuted cool. on my end. There we go. <laughs> um, so when I, when I think of, well, I'll just say my name is Najari Smith and I am the founding executive director of Rich City Rides, Richmond, um, based in Richmond, California. And it shocks me how often, you know, like a, a local org like ours that's been doing, you know, alternative healthy green transportation for over 10 years gets like overlooked for these types of um, opportunities that will help us build our capacity. We've already got 10 years of being in the community. And I'm not, I, you know, I guess I won't go as far to say that it doesn't, that um, local organizations weren't prioritized, but it just didn't really, it didn't feel that way. You know, like in, um, in our situation, we were passed up for an outside entity that um, was supposed to bring e-bikes to a specific community in Richmond from, from that our needs assessment report was based on. And it, the, the resources went to, to, to other parts of, you know, so many other out, better off parts of Richmond and it doesn't I don't see the majority of those bites in the community that that is that it was meant to serve and that really hurts my heart so I'm gonna say that local organizations aren't prioritized enough um and this is me coming from I'm a Richmond resident I live in close proximity to the to the neighborhood that these funds were meant to serve and um, just highly disappointed. So I want to know um, how you're prioritizing local organizations. M 
mind if I take this one, Ash? Um, Najari, thank you so much. Um, my name is Tabitha Willman. I am our manager of our clean transportation outreach section. And I think this is one of the things that we are wanting to do better. Um, and we're trying to figure out the best way to do this. And I think we need, <laughs> I think we need help from folks such as you. Um, we are hearing that there are organizations being overlooked. And these are the most um, organizations who are grassroots embedded in the communities. And um, I think where we want to start at, as we look to expand technical assistance and capacity building is with those communities that A, we're hearing from have been overlooked. So I definitely would love to connect with you offline and learn more about the situation and your um, community. And, and again, as Claire had mentioned, like, are there other organizations that are in the same boat that are being overlooked? And I think another thing is how do we, um, how do we best prioritize those communities? And we're, we're taking a look at this. We're trying to um, compile information and we've got information on individual programs where there's been uptake, um, where there hasn't been uptake and not just geographically, but also demographically too. Um, and then, you know, what, how do we build that prioritization into our projects? And I think that's a big area that I would love to, you know, talk a little bit more about for our technical assistance and capacity building on outreach, we're wanting to look at like, where do we have gaps? And then how do we partner? And this is something we're doing through our Access Clean California effort, um, which is outreach to communities and really providing more uh, capacity building resources to smaller community organizations that are embedded in the communities. And so anyway, I'm not, I don't wanna go on, but I wanna learn more from you. And so I thank you so much for speaking up. And if you're willing to have a conversation offline with us, we'd love to connect with you. And I'll just add one more point to that. Um, and uh, listen to the organization, and you guys had applied to the voucher program um, for funding in the first window. And unfortunately we ran out of funding. We had, we're oversubscribed in the first 24 hours. And so I appreciate your time and effort that you, you guys put into putting an application. Um, two things, uh, one, we learned that the application process is very cumbersome for organizations, for smaller organizations. And so we're trying to streamline that. Two, if the, in the governor's proposed budget, he's uh, there's a lot more money that can go to this these types of programs. And so, um, we're hoping that, you know, we can get, we, if the budget is passed with this uh, large allocation, we can fund the three projects that we've got to get more mobility grants out um, to smaller organizations, to organizations like yourself. So, um, uh, I, again, I appreciate your comments and, and your participation today. And one last thing that I'd like to add as well, Najari, is that I'm actually one of the lead staff that's working on the Bay Area Car Sharing and Mobility Hubs project. And I know Transform has worked with you previously or worked with Rich City Rides previously. So if there are ways that we can better integrate your organization within our existing mobility projects that are already on the ground, I think that's a really great opportunity. We welcome feedback on how that might be able to happen in a way that you can actually see these investments going out in the areas that need them the most. So just wanted to mention that and say equally Appreciate all the great feedback and look forward to hearing more from you. Okay, looks like um, there are no more raised hands or any questions in the Q&A at this time. Okay, um, so maybe then we can move on to the next portion of our discussion, not to say that anything we've covered already, you know, you can't ask additional questions or provide feedback, um, but I think for the interest of time, we can keep this discussion going. And I'd like to pass it off to my colleague, Bree Swenson, who will be discussing the long-term plan proposal and the questions today. Thank you so much, Bree. Thanks, Ashley. 
All right, so as Ashley said today, we're gonna talk about our high level approach to the long-term plan for CARB's clean mobility investments. Our desire was to go into more detail in this work group on how we actually um, propose to move forward with the, with the funding. Um, but because of some of the budget uncertainty and timing of the ZEV acceleration package that Ashley mentioned earlier, um, we'll instead focus a considerable amount of time on our questions for you all, which we'll go over at the end of the presentation. And then we'll follow up in the late May workgroup meeting with additional proposal details and refinements based on the feedback that we hear from you all today. So CARB plans to fund two types of grants to address communities' needs, planning and capacity building grants and clean mobility grants. And we'll get into what each of these entails in a few minutes. Neither of these categories are new, but we want to make sure we're emphasizing the equal importance of both for every type of project uh, in every type of community. So we expect that the ZEV acceleration package from the governor will result in more near-term investments through our existing clean mobility pilots and funding mechanisms, Ashley mentioned earlier as well. Um, in the short term, CARB will likely tweak the pilots in response to some of the consistent feedback that we've received. For example, we'll be looking for opportunities to align programs and simplify application processes based on past feedback, including based on comments we got in the last workgroup meeting. We may start to discuss those program specific changes in the next workgroup meeting in May, though many of those discussions will likely take place uh, at a program by program level after the the legislature passes this year's budget. In the longer term, CARB will continue to learn from and modify planning and capacity building and mobility programs on an annual basis based on feedback from partners like you and based on data from internal and third party evaluations like those that Ashley just went over. CARB may also use these funds as an opportunity to support projects that align with the intent of the regional sustainable community strategies to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And workforce development will be a crucial aspect of both planning and clean mobility programs. And lastly, the long-term plan will be guided by the clean mobility investment objectives that Ashley reviewed at the start of this meeting. So they'll kind of be the backbone that we continually refer back to, to make sure that we're really meeting the intent of these incentives. All right, so each year as we develop the funding plan for clean transportation incentives, we determine funding splits across clean mobility investments based on demand and other considerations. As I review our proposed funding splits, please keep in mind that these numbers are not final. We wanna hear your feedback on where funding is most needed and what approaches make the most sense to meet our clean transportation and equity goals. So out of an expected 419 million in the governor's January proposed budget, CARB proposes to use approximately 10%, that's $42 million, to cover planning and capacity building projects. We're proposing to use another 1% for state operations, that's $4 million, and state operations could include funding for the equity advisory group that we mentioned, cover gaps in our third party evaluations that Ashley mentioned earlier, um, and it could also cover additional staffing or administrative needs. The rest, approximately 373 million, would be available for CARB's existing clean mobility programs, which include clean mobility options, clean mobility in schools, and STEP. The current proposal is to split the remaining funding equally across the three mobility programs, but we do wanna hear your thoughts on what makes sense and we'll continue to re refine this proposal accordingly. We also acknowledge that this is not enough, it's a lot more funding than we're used to seeing in these programs, but it's not enough to cover all of the communities that need more access to clean mobility, but it is a really good start. So we're looking forward to continuing working on this, this funding. All right, so in the long-term plan also, CARB is required to identify the long-term need for planning and clean mobility projects. CARB has completed this analysis for some of our personal vehicle ownership programs in the past, but identifying the need for this much more flexible and varied set of project types like CARB's clean mobility projects is 
more challenging. So I'll go through some of the things that we're going to consider as we develop this methodology. CARB will consider lessons learned in its current pilots, including how much they were oversubscribed and how much project costs were underestimated. But we know this does not provide the full picture. We're aware that there are many communities that were interested in but did not apply for funding from each of our pilots initial funding rounds for a variety of reasons and we don't want to leave them out of the projections. We'll also consider how the potential for re replicating projects and implementing lessons learned in other communities could increase efficiencies in project implementation in later years down the road. And we recognize that CARB's clean mobility programs are not the only source of funding for clean mobility projects. The state has other funding programs, such as the Strategic Growth Council's Transformative Climate Communities Program and Caltrans's Active Transportation Program that fund some similar project types. Outside of state funding, we're tracking the potential for more federal funding for clean transportation and workforce development, and we're monitoring the impacts of the AB 285 report that Ashley mentioned earlier. Planning and capacity building grants will cover a wide variety of project types to address communities' varied needs on this topic. For example, some communities may need early capacity building support to develop local understanding of the clean mobility programs that we offer and clean transportation options available, or they might need uh, funding to complete equity assessments or equity training. Some communities may need to work collectively to identify transportation needs in their communities and potential solutions that interest residents. Other communities may have already undergone some of these processes and have identified the clean transportation projects that they'd like to pursue. Instead, those communities may need support with activities like identifying and connecting with relevant partners, co-designing project characteristics, conducting feasibility studies or fulfilling, fulfilling permitting, CEQA, or the California Environmental Quality Act and other readiness requirements. CARB plans to use lessons learned from the clean mobility options, community transportation needs assessment vouchers, clean mobility in schools, and the step planning and capacity building grants to inform how we structure this grant type. CARB's clean mobility grants will build on our existing clean mobility programs, clean mobility options, clean mobility in schools, and STEP. These existing programs provide a good starting point to evaluate and evolve our programs and investments over time. Similar to the planning and capacity building grants, the goal of these programs is to fund a wide variety of project types that address communities' varied needs. These projects will focus on expanding funding for clean transportation projects and related workforce development opportunities. Workforce development could include activities such as training for zero emission vehicle technicians, upskilling electricians for charging infrastructure installation, zero emission curriculum development, and more. We also plan to explore better ways to connect our clean mobility grants to funded planning and capacity building projects. For example, already some of our clean mobility programs require that any funded project address a previously identified community need we could expand that requirement to all of our clean mobility programs. We could also create a pathway to ensure clean mobility funding is available and streamlined for projects identified via CARB funded needs assessments or other planning efforts. And as I mentioned earlier, we're consider considering ways in which these clean mobility programs can continue to support implementation of the regional sustainable community strategies by focusing on funding projects that reduce vehicle miles traveled so this could include projects like bikeway construction, sidewalk installation and repair, public transit expansion, and new shuttle and van pool services as are currently funded through the STEP project. Lastly, this is not on the slide, but we know that technical assistance is important to increase equitable access to our funding programs and support project implementation. We're looking into different ways to expand technical assistance across all of our clean mobility programs and include application and broader implementation support. All right, so 
We now have a series of questions we'd like your thoughts on, and these will help inform not only the development of our longer term plan, but may also influence the structure of our current mobility investments. Um, I'm going to take like a couple at a time and then pause for discussion because we have this slide of questions and one more slide of questions. It's like probably over 10 questions and it could be a little overwhelming if we try to tackle it all at once. So read off a question and then and then we'll pause and have some time for discussion and for you know questions or comments on the overarching uh, approach that we've laid out here. So our first question is, what are additional considerations for measuring funding demand and needs across CARBS programs? Do you all have any suggestions for us to consider as we, as we develop this fin funding demand methodology? And I'm not seeing any raised hands or anything in the Q&A yet. Yeah, I think it's a challenging one. Um, so we'll keep that one open, open for discussion, but I will just go through a couple more that I think may be a little bit more tangible. So the next few questions are focused on our planning and capacity building grants specifically, um, and then their connection to our clean mobility grants. Should CARB front load planning and capacity building grant funding ahead of clean mobility grant implementation? Which type of funding, planning funding or mobility funding, is um, do communities need more right now? The, sec the next question is, what kind of planning and capacity building work is needed in communities? And then finally, is 10%, 42 million out of the total anticipated 419 million, enough to support planning and capacity building needs across the state? So as people are thinking about uh, how to respond to some of these questions, uh, for the first bullet, I'll just um, provide a little bit of background Right now, it's easy for us to go back and look at solicitations and the demand we got from the solicitations. But um, for like the CMO program, we closed the funding window after after one day because the demand was way more than what we had uh, had available for funding. So I don't necessarily think that's the best approach. And so, are there other approaches? Um, are there communities that are there? You know, how do we can we count up the number of communities that could be um, needing these types of resources and then provide an estimate based on that. So just a little bit of background on some of that thinking. Um, also on the question on um, what kind of planning and capacity building work is needed in communities. Um, right now we fund transportation needs assessments, um, planning grants, but we've heard the need for additional funding for things like feasibility studies. But we want, we want to know if there's additional funding that, that should be um, should be directed towards things like workforce training, um, uh, getting local residents funding to just learn about and educate their own communities about these programs. So um, different ideas, different approaches. Um, we know that one, one approach doesn't work for all the different uh, communities that we've got throughout the state. So um, just so hopefully that helped in, in some of uh, the thinking that um, you guys are, are are going through as we're reading off these questions. Here we have a raised hand from Caroline Rodier. Uh, Caroline will unmute your line and you'll be free to speak. Yeah, this is Caroline Rodier from UC Davis. So I can just give you a few comments that I have. Um, 
so for the first question, I'm just wondering um, if ARB had ever kind of, you know, considered one um, approach, it wouldn't be, you know, a complete, you know, there are many other ways you would go about this, but just to identify some, uh, some communities where there are really extreme needs. Um, and many times those communities do not have the ability um, to kind of put forward and organize what's needed in order to um, develop programs or applications and programs. So that's just one suggestion or perhaps for a third party contractor, um, kind of using, you know, maybe some of the metrics that you're already ready collecting. Um, so, and also with respect to the second bullet, um, if I can just give you my comments really quick, I, I don't think it should be one or the other. I mean, I think some communities have been working um, on developing, um, you know, their networks with CBOs and other organizations and they're ready to go, but um, others, others are not, um, and they need the time um, and funding to do this. Um, so I just, my comment on the planning and capacity building needs are enough. I don't have an, enough information to say um, with, for that 42 million, if it is adequate. I do think that the current funding for planning and capacity building is, is small. Um, those, those efforts are, are pretty costly actually to reach out to groups and, you know, um, plan events and get people involved and, you know, perhaps even hiring capacity in these organizations. Um, what gaps is Yeah, I would, I would just think, I think that, I think the grants have been like 50,000. I mean, maybe if you reached out to some of the planning, and it sounds like you may have already done this. Some of the groups have, that have participated in, in developing these planning capacity grants, if they could give you, um, you know, some insights into how much more money would be needed. Uh, I think that's my the end of my comments. Thanks, Caroline. Um, does anyone from the CMO team want to address the dollar amount for the planning for the needs assessment vouchers? I think that we have heard that um, fifty thousand for the needs a needs assessment is small. Caroline, uh, it's uh, Ava Yakubirad, uh, lead staff for CMO program. Thank you for your feedback. And um, we have actually um, uh, considered this and we increased the needs assessment voucher to 75,000. Uh, we work grouped it during summer, I believe, uh, with increasing the um, uh, project term to 12 months rather than only nine months. Um, so we, we're hoping that this additional little 25K will, will help communities to do more of a capacity building and needs assessment efforts that they need to do before um, applying for the claim mobility grants. And that's pretty specific to needs assessments, but um, we do also right now at least have the step planning and capacity building grants that are more on the order of 200,000 per, um, per grant and that cover kind of a wider variety of planning and capacity building needs, but we are interested, you know, we're still evaluating what the right, what the right amount is, what the right amount of time to do this work is, and if we're covering all of the different planning and capacity building needs that folks have. So um, what other kinds of like um, planning and capacity building support have you all seen, um, do you all need in your organizations or have you seen communities need to, to prepare a shovel ready project?
Uh, we have a raised hand from Najari Smith. Najari, we'll unmute your line. Yeah, thank you. Um, for like for this next round, have you considered like giving areas of need increased priority if they have on the ground existing um, community based organizations that are already doing work in work in this area? And if so, like how how is that? Um, what does that look like? Father Sam, do you want to take that for clean mobility options first? Yeah, I, I think overall, I mean, it's it's exciting for us to see such a large amount um, in in the proposed budget um, compared to previous years where we've had to really slice and dice between the three programs. And now that we're really going to build out this planning and capacity building grant portion of it. Um, having a lot more money allows us some flexibilities on how we'd want to prioritize those funding. Um, we don't normally talk about the prioritization of the funding um, for the funding plan process more further than what has been directed by the legislature. So we're directed to fund in disadvantaged communities, low-income communities, and low-income households for equity projects. Um, and what we've done is the implementation work groups after the funding plan has been adopted is where we get into those weeds and we've actually prioritized funding in the past for, for organizations and communities like tribal governments or rural communities. Um, so uh, one of the things we're thinking about if funding is available in the ZEV acceleration package is to, um, it is about the potential to focus some of that funding on local communities that had applied previously and, and not received funding because of oversubscription or other ways to prioritize funding, such as the organizations that are on the ground now um, that need more money to, to really get things launched. So um, your feedback now is, is, is cool. And um, once we have funding, we'll do more implementation work groups where we'll get into the weeds of, of, of how um, we can prioritize those funds to get out. Um, I can add that, um, at least first step, we have thought about that in the past. Um, and I think we, I can kind of elaborate on some of the challenges that we faced thus far and maybe get some um, thoughts from everyone. Um, one of the, one of the things we've done in step, um, someone else can tell me if this is the same for CMO. Um, is that a if a local government applies as the lead applicant to step an existing community-based organization has to be um, their partner on the application and vice versa um, i think it's been interesting to see like the different types of like based on our definition of community-based organization who is um who qualifies and um it might behoove us to to work on that definition and figure out like how we can make sure that this is like an organization that has like deep roots in the community and is really like um, ready to kind of fulfill the objectives of the program. I'll also just mention that we do, uh, we think that um, the it's great for community-based organizations to be partners but nothing, um, you know, you never have as much like, um, like authority and over the project as if you're the lead applicant. And so we want, we do want to see like more community-based organizations um, have the capacity to apply as lead applicants and like fully implement these projects. And um, in the step solicitation, we, had some an extra points category for if the application was led by a community-based organization. Honestly, I don't think it did that much this time around. It was like not very many, not very many extra points associated with that. So it's something that we'll look at for step in the future is like, should we be bumping that up or are there other ways that we can be prioritizing this like um, 
the community organizations to really lead these projects. So curious if anyone has any thoughts on that. Okay, um, we have a, another raised hand from Claire Bachman. Claire, we will unmute your line. Hi. Um, yeah, so regarding what Bree was talking about, um, the need for community-based organizations to have the capacity to be the main applicants for some of these clean mobil mobility grants. Um, my one of my recommendations just based on my experience um, helping some grassroots organizations around southern california apply for uh, like clean mobility type grants um what they what i see at least is that some organizations need technical assistance in the form of grant writing um that's like a huge barrier. Sometimes these applications require um, more information or um, than the organization like really understands how to like convey their message properly. Um, and another thing is like I think during throughout the pandemic, a lot of and this is like very much an assumption, but a lot of community-based organizations um, lost their nonprofit uh, 501c3 status. So technical assistance in the form of grant writing and um, like IRS nonprofit designation are really big uh, barriers preventing community-based organizations from being main applicants on these uh, state-funded grants. And yeah, like that's that's something that I think we all need to work on and, and make the application processes, um, I guess, more accessible. My recommendation for that, um, an example would be the Harbor Benefit Community Fund out of Wilmington um, for their community grant proposal process. The initial proposals were basically like just written statements of intent and then finalists were selected from from those um less were lessly worded applications so perhaps just having like a feeler like preliminary application process i don't know if that makes sense but let me know what you think Totally makes sense. Um, we've we've seen different versions of that kind of like concept phase um, before moving on before, and I definitely think it's something we'll look into. I think it's something that Clean Mobility Options is thinking about just for this next application window too. So maybe you all can talk about that. But I thanks Claire and thanks for you know any specific recommendations on programs that are doing this well that we should look at and model after are really, really helpful. Thank you. I can send some to your email. <laughs> Avar, Sam, did you want to talk at all about CMO? Okay, um, looks like we have another raised hand from Linda. Linda, will Hi. unmute your line. Great, thank you so much, Linda Commission, uh, Great Alternatives. I just wanted to ask, is the idea for the planning and capacity building funding that's proposed here, 
to be within each of the programs, the step and CMO, or separate, uh, the idea is to separate them out now to a, a, a different solicitation, uh, only because I'm, I'm wondering how some of the third party evaluations that are looking at some of the needs assessments would help to um, impact how the that would look like uh, based on the feedback uh, and, and uh, research that's being done. And then, um, and also the idea with the planning and, and capacity, or at least the, the needs assessments for CMO was to ensure that the projects that were, uh, because, uh, because uh, uh, an eligibility for the, the implementation projects was to demonstrate community need that, that there was a, a um, community engagement process, then the planning grants were also available so that folks can do that first and then apply for implementation. Uh, so those were tied together. I'm just curious if they're being separated out or if that's the idea for this, this funding. Sam, you wanna take that? Yeah, I think, I think part of what we're trying to do um, is move from that pilot phase to the program phase. Um, and we have needs assessment and planning grants in two different programs. Um, and so what we're trying to do is make it more general in that we have these planning and capacity building grant programs that a community can, can get funding for, do um, enable that community to get the resources to go from point A to point Z um, until they're ready to apply for uh, a, a grant for vehicles or bikes. Um, what we've what we've heard is that there are just gaps in between, you know, a community first learning about this and having no one understand what to do to the point of, hey, we're ready to go. We, you know, we're shovel ready. We've got a project that we think is feasible. Um, you know, we want to fund bikes in a certain community and we're ready to go. So this is supposed to help fill that. Um, but it's not only supposed to help fill that for our programs. There are other grant opportunities through other agencies, um, like Caltrans has active transportation grants. So this could be an opportunity to get communities to apply for those grants too. So uh, we're trying to open it up um, now that we've we've learned a lot from what um, what we've funded so far um, to to really really help all of those communities, no matter where they are in the planning phase. Um, to get to the point where they're ready to apply for a mobility grant. Hopefully that, that answered the question that you had, Linda. I can add a little bit to, um, thanks, Sam. So I guess part of it, Linda, is we don't know yet. <laughs> and we want, uh, we want to hear what, what you think, you know, like, uh, it may not be something that um, the structure of the planning grants may not be something that we have to determine like right away. Um, so we're trying to think of it kind of like more holistically, like what do we need to get out of these planning grants? But um, we are curious to hear your thoughts on like, you know, what makes sense logistically with getting that planning funding out. We do want to make sure that um, planning funding is also available for school districts, you know, like clean mobility in schools doesn't have this same um, planning and capacity building and needs assessment funding right now. And so we want to make sure it's open and available to all of the different applicant types we might get in our different clean mobility programs. The Othering and Belonging Institute is doing their, um, has their evaluation contract with us and um, as Ashley mentioned, we're kind of expecting to get the first kind of iteration of recommendations of the first report of the contract from them in July. And so um, we're really hoping that we can use a lot of the feedback that we get from them and, in, and recommendations and incorporate that into whatever the structure of the planning um, grant program or programs is. Um, and then I'll just mention, like you had mentioned that the, about the connection to, you know, our clean mobility funding. And Sam, I think said rightly that we're, we're trying to um, make sure that when we're funding planning efforts, like we're not constraining people to only be able to access funding from CARB, 
for implementation of that planning project. Like we want people to be able to access Caltrans funding and federal funding and other sources of funding to implement their projects. But we do also, you know, want to, we do want to fund the projects that um, we're confident have gone through this like really community centered approach. Um, and, and that we've seen do that because, you know, we've, we've been watching the project be implemented over the course of, um, of the program. And so we are kind of grappling with like, how do we, how should we connect the two better um, in or outside of like one umbrella program so that we can both like encourage people to access other sources of funding outside of CARB and we can also like streamline access to our funding if that's what they end up needing. So a lot of moving pieces, but if you have any ideas about um, logistically, like how you think this should work, we're really happy to hear them. Thanks, I appreciate uh, both of that. It's something to think about. Uh, and just thinking about other programs that you've mentioned, active transportation program a lot. Um, the that area of work is, you know, a, more established in terms of their requirements. And um, you know, even right now they opened up their cycle six for um, both infrastructure and non-infrastructure plans. So I think a lot of times when we're thinking about this planning um, and capacity building funding, being able to meet you know uh, a requirement for other types of funding programs we'd have to make sure that those are aligned there's alignment with what the other programs are requiring uh, so I would just uh, make that suggestion too is that if if we kind of want this this type of funding to be agnostic of what then the entity ends up applying for or using as a as a tool for other applications and other funding sources we want to make sure that it's uh, designed in a way that allows for them to, to be able to take it to other programs as well. Okay, uh, we have one more raised hand and then we'll move over to the Q and A. Uh, just raise hand, Lonnie Mason. We'll unmute your line and you'll be free to speak. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Lonnie Mason from First Generation Environmental Health and Economic Development from the Baby Hunters Point community. I kind of like totally disagree with some of the things that I heard when it comes to CBO, community-based organization, grassroots organization who foot are on the ground and um, we have more than the ability to handle the application with the support of the agencies, not NGOs. Um, we are capable of managing and handling things within our own community because we know what's best for our community. Unfortunately, you know, we have various NGOs that like to come into our community that have no interest at all, uh, no interest at all and making things better within our community. Their purpose is only there because of the money. If we have the support of CARB or the Air District, we're able to be able to complete the application and be able to do our job within our own community and do what's best for in our own communities. One thing um, um, I totally disagree when someone said the lack of, uh, um, what was it? she said in regards to them not having, you know, their tax identification or, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember everything, but uh, what was said, but the, the reason why these small organizations do not have, uh, say for instance, an accountant, or can't complete an application because they don't have the funding to hire the staff to be able to do those like large NGOs or agencies. 
if they are given the opportunity or given support through CAR or the Air District, they can do so. For instance, we brought it to CARB attention about an 80 page grant application. It made no sense. They reduced it from 80 pages to 20 pages in, su in support of the CBO. And that's what's appropriate, being able to work and support those small organizations, grassroots organizations, who can uh, uh, um, do what's best for their community. We don't want large NGOs coming in and stealing, stealing intellectual properties and then denying the small CBOs the opportunity to be able to work within their own community because this is what's happening. You give the support to them, why not give the support to the small CBO grassroots organization? This is what needs to be done. I don't want to take up too much of your time because this is what we talk about over and over and over. This is not something new to CARB. You guys understand what's going on and what's happening. You've given support to small other, as far as in the black community and what's going on in, um, in the Bayview Hunters Point community, when it comes to the clean air, clean air or when it comes to the, uh, the, the car situation, electrical car, no one did the outreach there. It wasn't until we brought it up, uh, me and a few other organizations, that we brought it up to bring it to their attention, to the air district and to car. There was no outreach done in that community. You could have worked with us, not, not use someone else to come and work with us. We would prefer to work with car or the Air District and to resolve this issue. We know what's best for our community. No outsider does. Why don't you take the time to work with small grassroots organizations? Thank you. Hey, Lonnie, I appreciate your comments. Um, I guess uh, I don't have a, you know, I totally understand what you're saying and your disagreements. I guess what we're trying to do is, is say there's hundreds of communities out there that are all in different, different boats. They, you know, there's some that have the capability to move forward, like your, your, your community. And there's others that just don't have anyone um, to help support them. So we're trying to provide the, the financial resources and the technical expertise and technical assistance to help across the board of wherever a community is at um, and how and allow funding for that community to be able to do what they think is best for their community. So um, one of the key issues we've had um, is that we haven't had enough funding to. So um, in the proposed budget, there is a lot more funding than we've ever had dedicated towards these types of programs. And so we know that isn't enough um, to, to satisfy every community in the state that has these needs, but it's a really good start. So again, we appreciate your, 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 um, your participation today and uh, we'll be in contact with you to, to work through uh, additional issues and see how we can make these programs more robust, but allow flexibility for communities depending on what their needs are. One question, you know, there, there was a, a situation where CARB did help a community in Stockton, no knowledge of environmental health at all. They've only been involved for like a year and they gave them like an $800,000 grant. Yes, CARB did. Without the application process, they helped them. They helped that particular program in Stockton. I'm sure you guys know it is, do your research. I don't have you know to go through the process but they helped that or that particular uh, uh, program, that particular organization in Stockton receive a $800,000 grant, if not more than that, without the application process. And they were shocked because we were in a meeting with them. We were on Zoom with CARB, with them and a few other organizations, small grassroots organization, and he happened to mention it in the Zoom, 
I'm, I'm assuming they wasn't expecting him to do so, but he did. Because they were shocked. They said, we wasn't even looking for this. We, we were just happy, you know, that they came to our assistant to help us out. So if, if you've done it, I'm sure it's been more than one time because there are other, you know, instances where you guys have, you can do it again. You can work with the small grassroots organization. It doesn't always have to go to NGOs, large NGOs, where they come in and they take the majority of the grant. They'll get a $2 million grant or a million dollar grant, and they'll come in because they need to come into that community because that's what the grant is for. You know, we know what AB 617 is for. You know, right now, they know. So the only way they can receive that grant is if they have some type of engagement with an organization within that community. And so what they do is they come in and they um, they come in and they um, uh, they come in and they they sorry about that they come in and they get involved with that small grassroots organization. Now I'm not for sure if it was eight hundred thousand. I know it was it was a high number. You know, that's all I'm saying is that they work with that organization. I could be wrong when it comes to the number, but all I know is that they came in and they supported that organization. You can do the same as well. I don't know what's going on in Southern California, but I'm, I'm sure it's not too much different than what's going on up here up north. So you guys have to work a little harder with that, especially within the Black African-American community. Because we are, we're on the lowest totem pole when it comes to any funding. We're not getting any help or assistance at all, especially when it comes to this, this car thing. You know, that's the, that's the problem. So let's try to work with that. Thank I appreciate you. it, Lonnie. Absolutely. Appreciate your time. We've got a number of questions in the Q&A. Um, I can start with um, Creighton had another comment. Our team mobility development can follow up with written comments on many of these questions, but to echo previous comments, I'll just add that a first year bridge of some sort, perhaps across all three proposed categories that could be flexible, but also merit-based and weighted towards community organizations that have already put in the work. Um, for example, a community a CMO voucher, a needs assessment, STEP or uh, clean mobility in school applicants, and a plus one to Bree's su suggestion about honing in on the definition of community-based organizations, as well as assessing readiness. Uh, appreciate your comments. Um, lead applicants, municipalities, this is from Najari Smith, another comment, are not always in touch with on the ground organizations. How do we make sure the partners they choose are authentically local? And I think that kind of goes back to what Lonnie was talking about a little bit. Um, right now, we have uh, eligibility criteria for nonprofit organizations, um, local governments. Um, it's, a, it's a great question and something that we'll, we'll um, work with you to better understand how we can identify uh, tools and metrics to help us um, help those uh, partners choose who they can, you know, um, to best support what they need in their in their community. Violet, do you want to jump on and start uh, with a couple of the other question and answers, Q and A's? Uh, thank you, Sam. So um, Loretta Ellard had a, a comment and question regarding needs assessments. So in our community, there's a desire among local agency city staff for a bike scooter share program to expand mobility options. Although we just did a round of public outreach for a regional transportation plan, we didn't receive bike scooter share type of comments. Although there were numerous comments supporting non-motorized infrastructure improvements, we now want to do a focused community needs assessment specifically on how the community feels about a bike scooter share program, is this allowed? We don't want another broad community needs assessment, so. I think um, 
the the goals for a community transportation needs assessment is really to understand the the range of transportation gaps and uh, what are some potential solutions for filling those gaps. But I think a big element of this is ensuring that the projects or the the types of needs are community identified and that they're also supported by the community. So I guess what we're we're trying to achieve with the, the needs assessment process is making sure again the community has been a uh, you know center in terms of central in terms of identifying what their needs are and then you know co-developing solutions. Uh, to fill those needs. And we want to make sure that like if you were to do a broader needs assessment that, you know, within that, with that, those things in mind that you would take those um, projects that were identified and kind of continue to move forward with that to, to build on those, those types of projects with the community. Uh, we, we don't want to fund predetermined projects, especially if they're not decided by the community, we wanna make sure that they're not decided and led by agencies or local government. I think that's a, a big piece to, you know, what we're trying to accomplish with the transportation needs assessments. I don't know if you have, if you wanna to add to that, Loretta, I know you have a number of other questions and, and comments and I can continue to start addressing those, but is there anything You'd like to add to that or others here at CARB? Okay, I can move forward for the moment. If uh, So the second comment question is if we fund our small focus needs assessments to be ready for the CMO, call for implementation projects, could we then use those needs assessment results in our implementation grant application? Would that be accept acceptable to CARB? Um, concerned that if we just apply for needs assessments uh, grant, we would have to wait for another cycle to apply for implementation. So again, this was a comment by Loretta Ellard. And I think um, the answer is you can certainly uh, self fund a transportation needs assessment um, the CMO voucher pilot has a framework in mind. So when you um, collect your transportation needs assessment findings, there are a number of data uh, points that we ask that you provide, as well as explaining some of the outreach and um, community participatory type elements to support the project you are identifying in your implementation project. So the goal again is um, emphasizing the results of the needs assessments and what the community identified and using that as support for the implementation project that you're trying to get funded. Um, so just to be clear, you don't have to go through the clean mobility options pilot needs assessment um, process to get funded for the implementation side of things for a mobility project voucher. You would just need to um, reviewed in the implementation manual, we we uh, we provide some specific uh, details on what would be needed to demonstrate how you're filling the needs of the community and the process you took. And there's specific uh, requirements on how to not so much convey it, but just you know, sort of following the same process that those that went through the voucher program had to do. Um, hopefully I answer that. Again, I invite anyone here at CARB to, to continue answering that if you have more to add. Yeah, I'll just uh, address the last question that she had. So if, if she decided to apply for a planning grant to do a needs assessment this cycle. Is there any assurance that implementation grants will continue to be offered every one or two years or so? Is the CMO program going to be around in the long term? Our goals are to have the, C, the clean mobility and the planning capacity building grant programs around for a long time. Um, historically, we've been funded every uh, on an annual basis, so there's been no guarantee. With this proposed budget, it does have four years worth of funding in there, 
And so there are opportunities for us to um, take into consideration folks that apply for a needs assessment, go through that process, and then have funding available for a, a project afterwards so that they don't have to, so that they know that there could be, there would be funding available. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. It's something we're thinking about on how we could um, ensure that the funding would be there for that mobility grant. So um, it's, it's something we're under, we're considering and um, um, how we can do that um, while also um, understanding that there's communities out there that don't need the needs assessment grants because they've already done that work or they've already done the planning and they're, you know, they may have shovel ready projects. So there's a balance between um, guaranteeing funding for folks that receive planning grants versus those that didn't. So, um, but we're happy to see that there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot more funding available now and um, we're hoping we'll get the continued uh, uh, um, uh, push from the legislature and the governor's office in future years for additional funding. Bree, do you want to um, move on with the questions? I think we've addressed them all. I think we have one more in the Q&A that from Claire Bachman. In the selection and evaluation process of clean mobility options grants in AB 617 communities, what weight does the amount of green jobs generated for community members hold? Um, right now for clean mobility options, there is not, um, it's based on first come first serve. So there's no weighting of scoring for, um, for the amount of green jobs a project um, would propose in their application. Um, but it's an eligible, you know, it's an eligible cost that will be covered with a voucher. Um, but currently there isn't a, a evaluation process for green jobs within clean mobility grants or the clean mobility option grant. Um, Bree, I don't know if there's additional information on step for yeah, uh, I can, workforce development and jobs. I can add for both step and clean mobility in schools. Um, in the past, we have not evaluated projects based on um, how many green jobs they generate within the community. We've evaluated them on their workforce development components, which could include, you know, training for green jobs in the community or, you know, intern internships, local hiring, like anything within that realm of workforce development. Um, but we haven't asked people to quantify the um, jobs up front. I think that's an interesting idea um, because I think we've seen that workforce development is becoming a more and more important aspect of these programs. Um, and we do want to make sure that there is more like local hiring going on. So thanks. All right, we will uh, move on to the next set of questions. And we kind of already touched on some of these a little bit. Um, Ashley, if you want to change slides, I see it happening. OK, thanks. Um, so you know, I think I'll just run through them all. Um, if you have any thoughts on any of them, please raise your hand or chat your comments in, and we'll always take ideas after the fact as well. Um, all right, so the next few questions focus on CARB's clean mobility programs, um, but some of this feedback might be applicable to the planning grants as well. So our first question is, should funding be split evenly across CARB's clean mobility programs, those three CMO, CMS, and STEP? And if not, which programs do you think need more funds? Um, would combining clean mobility programs reduce complexity and help streamline applications? Or would do you think combining those programs, CMO, CMIS, and STEP, or some combination, do you think that would make things more or less complicated? Are there other approaches CARB should prioritize to reduce program complexity? And are there benefits to having distinct programs? you know, CMOs, CMS and STEP be distinct programs. 
should CARB incorporate sustainable community strategy projects that reduce vehicle miles traveled um, into our other mobility programs? So, you know, projects like bikeway construction, sidewalk installation and repair, public transit expansion that might not exist in all of our mobility programs yet. What are the most impactful ways for CARB to increase access to funding for rural, tribal, and communities of color? Some ideas that we've talked about in the past and some that we've tried to implement in various forms are, um, should CARB only fund projects in these communities? Should we provide set-asides for these communities or provide extra points in the applications for these communities to kind of boost up uh, their scores? And how else might we prioritize investment in rural, tribal, and communities of color. And lastly, how much should CARB prioritize funding new communities versus maintaining existing projects? So um, we mentioned earlier, we're interested in figuring out how our funded clean mobility projects can sustain themselves financially over the long term. But in the meantime, some may require future CARB funding to stay afloat. And so the question is, when should CARB prioritize reducing the potential for stranded assets over investing in new communities. So we'll take any thoughts on any of this or any thoughts you have on our mobility project proposal. Okay, and I just want to check back in with uh, Claire Bachman. There's still a raised hand there. Uh, Claire, just seeing if you had a comment or question still. Hi, no, sorry, I just forgot to lower it like 15 minutes ago. My apologies. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Okay, we have some Q&A. Uh, I'll read the first one here from Piat Cannon. The even split of funding seems like a good approach as each program addresses different transportation needs and solutions. Um, a question from Loretta Eard. Uh, I would be interested in discussing combining CMO and STEP. If not a good idea, how are they different? Thanks, Loretta. Um, so I'll go through some of the key differences, but you know we are open to thinking about in the longer term, like whether these differences matter enough to or whether you know there are things that we can learn from each other's programs and end up you know merging them in the future so um just putting that out there but the way that they stand right now um clean mobility options is a first come first serve program so not competitive in the same way that step is at least and it um it provides smaller pots of funding for smaller projects um, specifically shared mobility projects. Um, logistically also it has like built in technical assistance through a statewide administrator. Um, STEP is intended for larger projects. So whereas clean mobility options is um, mobility projects currently are on the order of $1 million per project. Um, the STEP projects look more like the average project size is more like 8 million dollars, um, but there's a wide variety there. STEP funds um, a wider variety of project types right now. So it funds shared mobility projects, but then the idea is to fund like, you know, not just shared mobility, but a number of different um, clean transportation project types that might be needed, that might be identified by community residents. So um, things like public transit expansion, um, bikeways, pedestrian infrastructure, urban forestry, the kinds of things that would promote um, increased biking and walking. Um, STEP is directly administered by CARB right now. And um, I think those are some of the main differences, but they are kind of like sister programs, um, you know, one tackling kind of the smaller Oh, I, I should say STEP is competitively evaluated by CARB. So people have to submit an application. We go through the whole process of reviewing and scoring that and selecting awardees. Um, but yeah, they are, we're, we're trying to at least better align them and make sure that um, they kind of meet the different niche audiences that they have.
Does anyone have anything to add to that description? No. Looks like uh, we've got Caroline again. Yep, Caroline, uh, we'll unmute your line. Okay, I, I just had a quick question. So if you merge them, um, would you think about reorganizing the administration of the grant? For example, STEP is directly, as you mentioned, STEP is directly administered and the CMO has, um, you know, uh, I believe it's a contractual administrator. Um, would that change or how would you, I mean, would you ha have different requirements or you just want to create one big funding pot and people could, different organizations could um, apply for different projects um, within that pot? Yeah. So. Um... This is like, you know, down the road, long-term thinking. Um, it's not something that would happen this year. Uh, it's not something we think we're not, we're unsure if this will ever happen, but we do want to, to think about what it means. And so I think, look, we don't know is the short answer. Um, there are a lot of ways that we could go about it. And we want to try to explore like, you know, what are the pros and cons of having these different funding sources? Um, is it is it easier for people to like does does it help to have like to know um you know if i if i want to do this i apply to cmo if i want to do this i apply to step or is there um does it reduce complexity to to just have like one program overall and and so depending on you know what we determine is like the depending on what we hear from people and whether we think it makes it easier for people to have separate programs or to combine programs, then I think that would kind of inform the administration of the programs. Um, you know, I, I just had a couple of, just based on my experience in the Valley, just commenting on, yeah. I think the step is really amazing at getting things kind of off the ground, you know, kind of new things off the ground. And it's also just based on my experience, it's allowed for a significant portion of, a really significant amount of money going to community outreach. Um, and I think, well, whereas the CMO, it seems like it's really good for kind of scaling things that have worked and spreading them to other communities um, that may not have, you know, kind of the rich, community-based grassroots organizations to get them going. Um, but we're able to provide some. That's that's just my experience. I don't know if it's helpful. It is. OK, we have a comment in the Q&A uh, from Piet Cannon. The value of keeping the program separate is that a program like CMO is focused on the relatively new scheme of shared clean micromobility. This form of mobility seems to have good potential to reduce VMT and GHG emissions while increasing healthy transportation, such as bike and e-bike share. And I'm not seeing any other comments or questions in the Q&A and, and no more raised hands at this time. All right, then I'll just do one more call for any thoughts on these, these last two questions that um, we touched on a little bit earlier, but what are the most impactful ways for CARB to increase access to funding for rural, tribal, and communities of color? And how much should CARB prioritize funding in new communities versus maintaining existing projects? Any thoughts on either of those two questions?
All right. What do you think, Sam and Ashley? Are we ready to move on? Yeah, I think so. And then hopefully if there's any last comments or questions, we can cover that at the end. Sounds good. So we'll go on, um, not even to this slide, but to the next slide. Thank you. So um, we'll just power through here since we're almost at the end. I want to briefly go over upcoming meetings for the long-term plan development and the funding plan for clean transportation incentives. So our third public work group meeting on CARB's clean mobility investments so on the topic that we're talking about today is slated to take place in late May. By then, the governor's May budget should be released. So we hope to have a more solid understanding of how the ZEV acceleration package may impact our funding. And in that work group meeting, we hope to cover funding demand projections in more detail and potential changes to some of our individual programs in more detail as well. We also anticipate holding a third light duty vehicle focused workshop in late May to discuss the long-term vision for CARB's vehicle purchase incentive programs. All of this will culminate in the release of our proposed fiscal year 22-23 funding plan with, with the long-term plan included as an attachment for discussion in a public workshop in July and then for consideration at a board hearing later in the fall of, of this year. As always, we welcome additional feedback on our projects and on the long-term plan for clean mobility equity investments. Please feel free to reach out to us via the contact information provided on this slide. Anytime, um, you can ask follow-up questions, you can request more in-depth discussions on our long-term planning for our projects, and we can also direct you to the individual program staff that lead our individual programs if you want more information or you want to discuss those in, uh, specifically. And please do not forget to subscribe to our Gov Delivery Listserv to make sure you're staying informed and getting the latest information on coding on upcoming meetings, documents, and events. And so with that, I'll just ask if there are any additional comments or questions on the next steps or on any of the material that we covered today. Yeah, we have a couple comments in the Q&A. Um, First one from Creighton Randall to echo, uh, this is from our previous Q&A, to echo what the caller from the Hunters point mentioned, self-help investments will be most impactful. Uh, a comment from Loretta, speaking for rural communities, eligibility is key. We are not eligible for TCC and many other programs. And a, also a question from Loretta. With the fall 2022 final plan release, does that mean that's when the call for projects will occur? I'll take that question. Um, so there's two parts to it. One, normally uh, in years where we've had a, a budget um, approved in either the June timeframe or even as late as the September timeframe, um, what we'll do is we'll take the funding plan to our board in October, November. This year, it's planned to be taken in November. Um, once that is approved, and unless there are substantial changes that the board asks us to move forward with, um, what we would normally do is uh, what we call implementation uh, work group meetings um, um, to help clarify or better determine the project criteria for each program that the board approved funding for. Um, once that's done, there's a couple of mechanisms to get funding out. Um, one would be doing competitive solicitations. Another could be adding funding to um, uh, the program administrator like the CMO program. Um, the, other, uh, the other piece of this that, that kind of throws us in, the, in a loop is that if with the governor's proposed ZEV acceleration package, if there is funding that's allocated specific to um, one or more of these mobility programs, then what we would do is go back to the funding plan that was approved last year and see how the funding um, was uh, provided to communities um, through the previous funding plan. So um, if that occurs, then we will have additional implementation work groups um, once, the, uh, once the governor signs the budget and it, and it uh, provides us with direction on what to fund and where um, where that funding 
would uh, be allocated to. So hopefully I, I answered that question um, clearly, but there's some caveats, so appreciate it. And just okay. a follow-up question. Yeah. Yep, Loretta said it. Loretta said, I don't understand. Okay. Um, so in the past, we've gotten funding out through two mechanisms. One is competitive solicitations, and another is through the first come, first serve process um, through the CMO program. So if funding is a, approved in the budget and our board approves the funding plan in November, then after that, we would hold more implementation work groups and then get funding out through one of those two mechanisms. So we're looking at um, early to mid 2023 before funds would get out. If the um, ZEV acceleration package is part of the budget and we get funds to expend now, then we would use the mechanisms that we've already had the board approve in place. So we could add funding to the CMO voucher program and open up a funding window this year or do um, solicitations um, for step or clean mobility in schools this year. So it, it just depends on um, the timing of when the funding, what budget the funding would be put into. So hopefully that clarifies it a little bit better. Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands or any other questions or comments in the Q&A at this time. All right. Well then, thanks, Sean. And thank you all for attending today's work group discussion. We really appreciate your time. We'll plan to send out the Gov del delivery notice for the May work group meeting in the next few weeks. So please make sure you subscribe to that and stay tuned. And we hope to continue uh, working with you all to develop the, these incentives. Have a good rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate your time. Take care, all.